For the video version of this podcast, please visit our YouTube channel, Daughters of the American Revolution National Headquarters. Otherwise, please enjoy this audio podcast on your favorite podcast streaming platform. This is the DAR Today podcast. I'm your host, Brooke Bullmaster Stewart, National Chair of the DAR Today podcast committee. This year, we have a new initiative with the Rural Concerns uh, to try and work with these smaller chapters. Uh, maybe out in rural areas to see how we can assist them in, in getting stronger. Can you feel it? The month of June gives us the start of those long, lazy summer days and magical summer nights. As classroom doors burst open, warm weather beckons us outdoors for afternoons along the water. Father's Day barbecues, family vacations, the summer seems to stretch far in front of us with endless possibilities. And aren't late May and June truly the start of our patriotic season? It's a time for refreshing our front porches with a new flag for Memorial Day and Flag Day and in anticipation of the 4th of July picnics and parades. A time when we come together as a nation for thoughtful remembrance and celebration of our country's birth. And of course, for those of us in the DAR, June is the much-anticipated time to return to our house beautiful in Washington, D.C., and what better place to inspire patriotism. While you're in D.C. during Continental Congress, you might see us out and about filming and taking pictures. If so, be sure to say hello. And you'll want to stop by the DAR Today podcast table Friday evening during that Sparkle and Service Committee showcase. Join us there and share your ideas about what you'd like to hear in upcoming episodes. And then, of course, let's take a quick selfie. We'd love to meet you. But for today, and in honor of Father's Day, let's dedicate this month's program to fathers everywhere. Our founding fathers who established a blueprint for an amazing course to independence and all fathers since who, along with inspirational women like those that will be featured in this episode, guide and support our next generation of leaders. You may remember that back in March of this year, we had a segment about the Daughters Online community and a wonderful interview with the National Chair of Public Relations and Media for DAR, Kate Johans. We wanted to do a little follow-up segment with DAR member Kathy Krusko, that shows a neat example of what could potentially happen when you fully utilize everything there is on the Daughters Online community, or as we affectionately call it, the DOC. My experience with the Daughters Online community has been fantastic. I fully set up my profile and love that it is like LinkedIn on steroids, containing not only all of my DAR activity, but also activity on my professional career. My career, which funds my DAR and genealogy passion, is sitting on public and private boards. Fully setting up my profile led to a Connecticut daughter contacting me that has a similar career and wanting to connect. There are not as many women as there are men in this career, and so it's important for us that share similar interests to support one another, share career growth opportunities, and be able to connect. And that's a win for all women. The two of us plan to meet up at Continental Congress this year and build on our initial connection. So I encourage everyone to fully set up their profile so they can connect with daughters within their state and in all of the other states and countries that we're represented in. We're speaking today with Nancy Sherm Wright, who's the organizing secretary general for the Wright Administration. Thank you so much, Nancy, for being here today. It's a pleasure to be here, Brooke, and be able to send a message to our members. Tell us a little bit about your history. Where did you grow up? I grew up, I was born and raised in Canal Winchester, Ohio, which is just southeast of Columbus, and um, went to school there and then went out to college and um, St. Louis, Missouri, Washington University, and that's where I joined DAR, was out out there, and I found, it's kind of a funny story, all of a sudden one day, I knew I was eligible, I wanted to join the DAR, and it's the best kept secret in the world at that time, 
and because I, I tried to find a phone number, whatever, and then I remembered that there, the DAR magazine was over at the local library. So I went over there and looked in the library, and it happened to be Missouri's month uh, for advertising. So I looked up the state regent who lived in St. Louis and called her, and um, I joined the Webster Groves chapter, which was uh, Lona Best Barnett's chapter. And I, she just got me involved from the get-go. And I am a 50-year member, and which I'm very proud of. And I've just had so many experiences happy ones, made so many lifelong friends in DAR. Then we moved back to Ohio. My husband got tired of the drive, and I said, great, let's, <laughs> let's move back. And so I live in my grandparents' house in downtown Canal Winchester. Tell us about your role as Organizing Secretary General. What's involved in this position? The Organizing Secretary General's office handles membership, all your membership information that goes into e-membership goes through organizing. We organize chapters. We have a handbook on how to organize, also how to merge, also um, the dreaded D word for disbanding, which we don't like to do. And so that's what our office staff does. We've got a great office staff who are so helpful and so kind to our members. I can't say enough about them. Is there anything new about your role within the Wright administration? Is there anything different now? I think one thing I'm also, besides being organizing secretary general, I am also the national chair of the uh, Chapter Development Revitalization Commission, or the CDRC. And it really works hand in hand. And I am, I am the liaison, executive liaison, for the membership, community service awards, uh, community classroom committees, and the CDRC. And it's just exciting to work with those people. But with the CDRC, we are also, we're trying to help chapters revitalize and develop. And so they, they can use the information from organizing and, and it also comes back because any problems that we find, then we can use that in, in organizing as well. And this year we have a new initiative with the Rural Concerns uh, to try and work with the smaller chapters, uh, maybe out in rural areas to see how we can assist them in, in getting stronger. And also with coming out of COVID, you know, a lot of the chapters have lost connection with their members. And so we're trying to get everybody reconnected and also to make some of these members who maybe weren't attending even before COVID that um, get them involved. Now, for you personally, besides your DAR activities, what would you consider an hour well spent? I like, I like to help people or be a cheerleader for them. Um, I like to teach people and maybe stuff about DAR. I also <clears throat> work on my own genealogy. And if I can help a friend get their genealogy done or maybe take somebody for a doctor's appointment or wh whatever, it makes me feel good. I'm not looking for kudos and, and that type of thing. It just makes me feel good that I can help someone. Now, I've heard something interesting, that your nickname might just be the help desk and that information is your superpower. Tell me about that. Well, since I've been a member for 50 years, I've picked up a little bit of knowledge. And then I also worked the DAR help desk for 12 years, and which is great fun because you explain people and some, some are very, they're panicking because they don't have their password or whatever to finish up their chapter, you know, master report. And, and so they think we're sitting here in Washington, D.C., and, and we're actually sitting in our comfy clothes at home. <laughs> I may not know the answer, but I'm usually probably a good uh, traffic cop. And so I can point and go, well, you better contact so-and-so. They should know. Thank you so much, Mrs. Wright, for your time today. It's so great to get to know you better, and we're so happy that you're part of the National Board.
I have the pleasure of speaking today with Denise McNichol Bullock. Thank you so much for being here today, Denise. Why don't you tell us about your position and how that came about within the Wright administration? Thank you so much for having me. My position is the National Vice Chair on the CDRC, the Chapter Development and Revitalization Commission for Rural Concerns. And that came about in the Wright administration because we recognize that the, there are rural chapters all over the states and they all need special attention and consideration with the specific challenges they face. As state organizing secretary in Kansas, I, I recognized a lot of those challenges and through different conversations with other people, we found out that it, it was definitely an issue that needed to be recognized. And it's a very important segment of our society. So tell us about the plans that you're putting out there or ideas that you are suggesting to help these rural chapters. Well, first of all, we wanted to make sure that people understand that there, this is definitely a focus now within this administration. We've had one article in the Daughters Newsletter about rural concerns. In that article, we mentioned that the rural populations are decreasing. Their population density has decreased. And we have to recognize that many of them don't have broadband capabilities to hold electronic meetings. So during the pandemic, many of them just were out of touch with their chapter members and unable to meet together. So there's a lot of time to make up on that. So what we're hoping is that we're, we're developing a framework so that they will recognize and their state leadership will recognize that with just a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of appreciation, and some enthusiasm shared that they can turn things around. Recently, we did a, a analysis on chapter size and found that as of March 11th of this year, there's 1,265 chapters in the states with 50 or less members. And these chapters represent 40,000 plus members. So it's 22.5% of our total membership. 22% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you talk about revenue, that's $1.8 million in dues. That's um, a lot of creative ideas. And it's um, segments of our population that are resilient. They've, they've come through a lot and they face economy changes and demographic changes that um, many of us don't see. We've come up with several initiatives that have, have been successful already. And we're hoping that more chapters will try them. The first one was a creating the ties of DAR service and friendship. And the goal of that one was to encourage, train, and support chapters that are facing struggles, specifically those in rural areas, and help them achieve success. And that means a collaboration with their state leadership, whether it's state officers or state chairs, talking with them, collaborating on ideas. And then the second initiative was called Meet Them Where They Are, so that people actually get out and visit these ladies in the most beautiful parts of our country. Um, we, we often think about rural areas being desolate and, you know, just blank. And there's some beautiful areas of our country in the rural areas. And if you go out and visit them, you'll, you'll see that they have a lot going on, even though they're away from the population areas. In Meet Them Where We Are, we wanted to provide additional training for chapter leaders in those areas so they can broaden their knowledge, build their confidence in leadership roles, and promote smooth leadership transitions. Just like every chapter, large or small, you want to look towards the future and have people ready to step in in leadership positions. When we were talking before, and I was realizing in my own chapter, it takes me 10, 15 minutes to get to my chapter meeting. Mm -hmm. But for those other areas, and when we think of that, I love that you brought up those statistics, Denise, because 22%, you know, so over a fifth of our membership are mm -hmm. separate from others. That many of these ladies might drive 30 minutes to an hour for a chapter meeting because the, the population is spread out. And then people wonder, well, why don't they ever come to our state meeting? Some of those drives might be three and four hours. Um, some of these ladies deal with um, harvest seasons where they need to be around to help if their husband is a farmer. They need to be around during calving season when if they're out on a ranch. Things that many of us in the cities don't recognize. And having grown up on a century and a half farm in the center of Kansas, I feel like I have an understanding of that, even though I'm now in the population center. 
Can you share a couple of success stories that you've had so far? Well, that's the good news. There are success stories and these women are not giving up. I call them small but mighty. And one of them was a chapter that was struggling with membership numbers and had been for a long time. And they reached out to a state leadership team and said, we want to have a workshop. And through that collaboration, this chapter did all the legwork, had the place ready, had prospective members there. They brought everybody from their PMD and they were prepared. And then the state leadership team went in with computers and printers and application paper. And by the end of the day, they had five signed and complete applications. And they are working on four additional ones that are looking for just maybe one or two um, documents. So that was one great success story. And it was through the collaboration between those state leaders and the chapter leaders that made that happen. On the Daughters Online community, a woman shared that she was the state chair of their chapter master reports. And she was excited to see a chapter that had less than 25 members that scored as many or more points on their CMR and CAA than chapters with over 100 members. So how are they doing that? They're engaging their membership. They're getting out in the community. They're finding area newspapers. There are benefits to smaller rural areas because there's always a newspaper around somewhere. In the bigger cities, you're, it's hard to get any press for your activities. There are a lot of community events, festivals, Boy Scout troops. If you can get involved with a Boy Scout troop and help them earn their genealogy badge, there's so many opportunities that you might not see when it's right in your own backyard. And that's when it, why it helps to have state leaders go meet them where they are and see, see what they're doing, appreciate what they're doing. But there is good news with these small but mighty chapters. I think you're absolutely right on that, that the state leadership getting involved, I think is, you know, those chapters don't feel like they're alone out there by themselves. That's right. That's and my, my buzzwords are give them attention, give them encouragement, engagement, and then appreciate every little thing they're doing because not any chapter can do everything, but every chapter can do something. I love that you're part of the CDRC team and I'm sure Nancy Sherm Wright loves having you as part of her team. So thank you so much for everything you're doing and uh, for being here with us today. So thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be here and I hope people will contact me if there's anything I can do to help. On a summer day in 1866, Mary Edwards Walker exited a milliner's store on Canal Street in New York and was promptly arrested. A report the following day stated, The lady wore a long coat or robe and a pair of cloth pants, and the guardian of the public peace, imagining that there was something wrong about this and that a lady ought not be allowed to dress as she pleases, undertook to arrest her. <laughs> But, entire truth be told, it wasn't just patrol officer Patrick Pickett who was concerned. Other female customers in the store were also taken aback by her attire. Walker was arrested for impersonating a man, an offense that purportedly caused public excitement, was classified as a misdemeanor, punishable by fine and, if repeated, incarceration. But by 1866, Walker was known for much more than causing a stir with her attire. She was an abolitionist, prohibitionist, surgeon, and as of 1865, the only female Medal of Honor recipient. So how about taking a guess at a dazzling daughter chosen to appear on a coin? The American Women Quarters Program is a four-year program celebrating the accomplishments and contributions made by exemplary women of the United States. In 2024, the U.S. Mint will release a quarter honoring fellow DAR daughter, Dr. Mary Edwards Walker. She's a sparkling example of a woman who defied the expectations of her time. A woman who truly made history. Let's take a richer look at Dr. Walker's life. Born in Oswego, New York, February 26, 1832, Mary and her six brothers and sisters were raised by progressive but devout Christian parents, Alva and Vest Whitcomb Walker. Tasked with helping on the farm, Mary often wore trousers and shirts because they were more comfortable. The family was anti-alcohol, anti-tobacco, and her father believed wearing corsets was damaging to one's health. 
In a late 1890s interview with the Syracuse Standard, she told a reporter that she was, quote, the original new woman, end quote. And when dress reform for women was begun in the early 1840s by the likes of Lucy Stone, Mrs. Bloomer, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony, she was, as she said, already wearing pants. Hers was a family of free thinkers that also emphasized the importance of education for girls. Her parents created the first free school in Oswego, New York, in order that their daughters received an education equal to their sons. Mary carried her nonconformist attitude with her throughout her entire life. Upon completing their education at their parents' school, Mary and two of her older sisters then graduated from Bailey Seminary in Fulton, New York. She took a job as a teacher, but realized her true calling was medicine and saved her income for medical school. In 1855, Mary Walker graduated with honors from Syracuse Medical College, the only woman in her class and only the second woman in the country with a medical degree. She was 23 years old. One year later, she married fellow medical student Albert Miller. The two opened a practice, but neither it nor their marriage would ultimately be successful. So she set them both aside in 1859. When the Civil War broke out, Walker was 28 years old, and for four years she treated both wounded soldiers and injured civilians, and by special approval from Congress, she adopted male attire. The New York Tribune wrote of her in December 1862, and I quote, Dressed in male habiliments, with the exception of a girlish-looking straw hat, decked off with an ostrich feather, a petite figure and feminine features— she carries herself amid the camp with a jaunty air of dignity, well calculated to receive the sincere respect of the soldiers. She can amputate a limb with the skill of an old surgeon and administer medicine equally as well. Strange to say that, although she has frequently applied for a permanent position in the medical corps, she has never been formally assigned to any particular duty, end quote. But that changed in 1864 as Walker was assigned a position as acting assistant surgeon to the 53rd Ohio Volunteers, an appointment that the director of the medical staff called a medical monstrosity. In April of 1864, she became a prisoner of the Confederacy and was taken to Castle Thunder Prison in Richmond, Virginia. She was released in a prisoner exchange in August of the same year and traded for a male Confederate surgeon. She became the first woman officer ever exchanged as a prisoner of war for a man of the same rank, an event she considered affirmation of her worth. She spent the next six months in the Union's Louisville Female Military Prison, serving as an acting assistant surgeon. She found this role difficult not for the task, but due to male co-workers continually undermining her authority by encouraging prisoners to refuse treatment and medication from her. Upon leaving service for the government in 1865, she continued to dress as she pleased, embracing the comfort of pants, and the remainder of her life was spent fighting for, as you would guess, women's dress reform and women's right to political suffrage. In November of 1865, Dr. Walker was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Andrew Johnson for her numerous acts of heroism and bravery. Her citation was as follows, and I quote, Whereas it appears from official reports that Dr. Mary E. Walker, a graduate of medicine, has rendered valuable service to the government, and her efforts have been earnest and untiring in a variety of ways, and that she was assigned to duty and served as an assistant surgeon in charge of female prisoners at Louisville, Kentucky, upon the recommendation of Majors General Sherman and Thomas, and faithfully served as contract surgeon in the service of the United States, and has devoted herself with much patriotic zeal to the sick and wounded soldiers, both in the field and hospitals, to the detriment of her own health, and has also endured hardships as a prisoner of war four months in a southern prison while acting as contract surgeon, and whereas, by reason of her not being a commissioned officer in the military service, a brevet or honorary rank cannot, under existing laws, be conferred upon her, and whereas, in the opinion of the President, an honorable recognition of her services and sufferings should be made, it is ordered that a testimonial thereof shall be hereby made and given to the said Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, and that the usual Medal of Honor for Meritorious Service be given her." End quote. However, this honor was not to stand. 
Walker's medal was rescinded in 1917, two years before she died, along with 910 other Medal of Honor recipients due to their status as civilians and not commissioned officers during the war, even though they served on the battlefield. Well, Dr. Walker refused to return the medal and continued to wear it until she died two years later. According to one legend, when federal marshals attempted to retrieve it in 1917, she opened the door holding a shotgun and wearing her medal. Walker was an ardent suffragist. However, unlike others, she argued that women were already entitled to vote. From her perspective, the phrase, we the people, is not gender-specific. Therefore, there was no need to enshrine in the Constitution a right already granted. Walker made an unsuccessful bid for the U.S. Senate in 1881 and an unsuccessful attempt as a Democratic candidate for a seat in Congress in 1890. Dr. Walker's attire continued to be a source of ridicule her entire life. In 1914, she was introduced as a novelty. Cartoon caricatures and hoax invitations made light of the equality she desperately sought. But despite the mocking that she endured, she never lost her love of country. When buried beneath the ground, wrap that flag, my corpse around, plant that flag above my grave, then let it wave, let it wave, she wrote before she died. Women gained the right to vote one year after her death. Walker's health began to fail after a fall on the steps of the United States Capitol building in D.C. in 1917. She went home to Oswego and passed at the home of her neighbor on February 21, 1919, at the age of 86. Her funeral arrangements had been finalized by her nearly 15 years prior, including the making of a pre-postmortem photograph of Mary in a casket surrounded by flowers. She swore that was going to be a trend that caught on. 1977 saw President Jimmy Carter restore the legitimacy to Walker's medal thanks to tireless efforts made by her family, stating that her acts of distinguished gallantry, self-sacrifice, patriotism, dedication, and unflinching loyalty to her country, despite the apparent discrimination because of her sex, warranted the award. To date, Dr. Walker remains the only woman to have been awarded the Medal of Honor and the Mary Walker stamp was issued on June 10, 1982 in commemoration of her receipt of the Medal of Honor. In 2012, a 900-pound bronze statue honoring Walker was installed in front of the Oswego Town Hall. And now the sparkling Dr. Walker will receive two more honors by the U.S. government. In addition to being honored on a coin, a military fort will also be renamed in her honor. The design of Dr. Walker's quarter will be unveiled in spring or early summer of 2023, with quarters available in 2024. I can't wait to get mine so that I will be continually reminded of this extraordinary woman, Dr. Mary Edwards Walker. We're speaking today with the National Chair of the Flag of the United States of America Committee, Maria Blinn. Thank you so much, Maria, for being here today. Thank you for having me, Brooke. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the goals of your committee? The goals of our committee are to keep the American flag flying continuously, to protect it under all conditions, and to educate the public on proper flag usage and respect for the flag. And what are the tools and resources that you use to accomplish these goals? Oh, Brooke, we have many resources available on the national website on the flag committee pages. We have minutes that you can share at your meeting. We have a bingo game that is so much fun. And I do want to mention that all of the resources have been designed to educate about flags and while you're having fun. It's just a great time. And we have a wonderful program on the Star Spangled Banner. So if you have a speaker that cancels and you need something at the last minute, Go to the Flag Committee webpage and print this off. You won't be disappointed. We have many resources available at the DAR store. We have the Flag Code brochure, which everyone should have a copy. We have a Braille flag book, and this is a community that has not received much attention, so it's important we get these out into the community. Another wonderful resource that we have is the Constitution flag. And you can order that in honor or in memory of a special individual, and we will fly that above Constitution Hall for you. It's folded up, put into a beautiful presentation 
box along with a customized certificate, and then it's ready to be uh, presented to a veteran, a special speaker, or a loved one. So your committee has a page on the new Daughters Online community. That's pretty exciting. Tell us what members will find there when they visit your page. Oh, Brooke, the Daughters Online community is really an exciting resource that we have now. When you come to the FLAG community page, you will be able to participate in discussions about FLAG questions, the FLAG code, uh, anything that you want to ask. There will be many people that can answer your questions. And also, it's a great place to post your photos. We share ideas. A picture is worth a thousand words. I then was able to ask Maria about her national vice chairs. I love my team. I have two flag raisers, Sue Maglin and Eleanor Price, and they come into D.C. and they help me raise flags, the Constitution Hall flags. We also have Kara Hotz, who is our communication national vice chair, and she is the one who has created all of the graphics for the Facebook page for the Flag Flying Days, and she will create graphics also for the community uh, flag page on the Daughters Online community. Kara is also our editor for the Flag Post News. It is a newsletter that is published quarterly by all of our team, including the division vice chairs. It is your one-stop shopping for all things flag related. And what's great about the newsletter is you can go online and you can print off copies for your chapter meeting, and you can also access previous copies as well. Well, thank you so much, Maria, for being here today, for letting us know about this incredibly vital committee in DAR. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. In honor of the 19th Amendment approved June 4th, 1919, we leave you with this quote by Susan B. Anthony. Men, their rights, and nothing more. Women, their rights, and nothing less. Well, thanks for listening and be well, dear friends. Let's celebrate the stars and stripes forever. And remember, with all of your ancestors behind you, you are the result of the love of thousands. This podcast was written and produced by our incredible team of writers and editors, but special gratitude is expressed today, well... For all of them, we really have quite a fantastic group of women that all pull together and make this happen and never complain about the rewrites, the re-edits, etc., etc. All of you, you rock. And we are, as always, so grateful for President General Pamela Edwards Rouse Wright and Historian General Suzanne Heskey for their constant guidance. To Maria Blinn, to Nancy Sherm Wright, and Denise McNichol Bullock for being so generous with their time. The National Society Daughters of the American Revolution is a nonprofit, nonpolitical volunteer women's service organization dedicated to promoting patriotism, preserving American history, and securing America's future through better education for children. Members are all lineal descendants of those who supported the cause of independence in the Revolutionary War. For more information, please visit DAR.org. This is the DAR Today podcast.